much but hurt in some segments of the society, including the feminist segment, as the discussion to extend selective service to women progresses. You see, once you start talking about equal responsibilities, that's when you become Satan. Because heaven forbid women start earning their privileges. Let's explore. Hello everyone and welcome to the Freedom Alternative. Several leaders in the strongest military in the world have started seriously pushing for what was coming for years now, the extension of the registration for selective service to the privileged half of the population. Now, for those of you who may not know, in the United States, unlike let's say Finland or Greece, the question of compulsory military service is not on the agenda. People are not forced to serve in the military and haven't been for over 40 years, since 1973 to be more precise. However, at this moment, men and men only have to make themselves available by signing a legally binding paper which states that if Uncle Sam needs them to die, they ought to be willing to do so, no questions asked. Failing to sign that per paper comes with uh, several direct punishments, such as being denied most federal loans and federal jobs, as well as some municipal jobs. But it also comes with potential punishments that don't always apply, such as a $250,000 fine and five years in a federal prison. You're a young white man and want to go to college and don't have enough cash? Well, tough luck. You don't qualify for any racist or sexist, <coughs> <coughs> I mean, affirmative action programs. And in addition to that, you must also bind yourself legally to Uncle Sam with your willingness to die for the Uncle Sam. Then, and only then, you may get a student loan. Isn't white male privilege great? So, in the interest of equality and fairness, the top Army and Marine Corps generals have come out saying that all women should have to register for the draft, now that combat jobs are also open to them. Just days after this recommendation, two Republicans in the House have introduced a bill that would make this the law of the land. Oh, this is fun. To make things funnier, once uh, the gynocentrists du jour realized that, gasp, this may actually make women adults, it's suddenly fashionable to make the case that selective service should be abolished. Funny how that works. Five years ago, when non-feminist vanguards were making the exact same case, they were brutally dismissed as man-children who need to grow up. The cult of the holy Vajayjay runs deep. But nowhere does it run deeper than on Glenn Beck's turf, where the butthurt of Matt Walsh reached full Macintosh levels and went full circle, with a headline that can one can only one can hardly know whether it's from the supposed right-wing individualists or for Je from Jezebel type uh, far left collectivists now what the media isn't saying these days is that the ball has gotten rolling uh, following a lawsuit filed by the National Coalition for Men against the selective service on exactly the same grounds namely that if equality under the law means anything then surely forcing women to join the rest of adults and commit to defending the nation is a logical step. Now, the way I characterize the whole thing would seem to suggest that I support the measure, doesn't it? Well, I don't. The trouble is that the mainstream no side is so pathetic in its argument that I want nothing to do with them. The mainstream yes side supports this on egalitarian grounds. The mainstream no side opposes this because equality doesn't mean sameness. Yet for some reason this comes from exactly the same people for whom equality does mean sameness when it comes to what they perceive as the goodies of men's lives. They're both a bunch of hypocrites for the most part anyway. And here's why. The only two countries that enforce some conscription upon women are Norway and Israel. And that's in theory. In practice, both in Norway and in Israel, 
women represent a tiny proportion of the military as a whole and an even tinier proportion of actual frontline fighters. I think it was Bad Pop who dug up the numbers some time ago and in Israel women were something like 3% of the military as a whole and a bit under 1% of actual fighters. My Israeli friends, including those who served or still do serve for the IDF, confirmed to me what I was already suspecting. The idea of integrating women into the military on par with men is simply not working in real life. Sure, there is the occasional badass woman, but as a rule, women simply aren't cut for this job to the same extent as men are. It's just the way it is. But while the yes side can at worst be blamed for being naive, the no side looks even worse. You see, most of the those on the yes side are indeed willing to admit that full equality isn't possible and are willing to formulate nuances such as well, if there would be a draft, women could be assigned to less physically demanding jobs that are still critical in military operation, such as mechanics or driving trucks, or words to that effect. Now, we can argue all day long whether this is due to inherent gynocentrism, biology, bio, biology or a combination of the two, or some other cultural reason, but it doesn't matter. It is what it is, and in matters of public policy, accepting reality is part of formulating sound policies. The no side, however, is in my view a lot worse because they want to have their cake and eat it too. You see, for most of human history, ideas such as human rights or voting simply didn't exist at all. Once they finally emerged, they tended to be tied with military service or with property, or both. That's why you had women voting in, in the 1840s even though there were no suffragettes and the idea of women's suffrage hadn't even been born yet. These privileges weren't actually tied to one's sex but to one's achievements or luck since some women of the 1840s voted because they inherited their father's or husband's business or land. This applied pretty much everywhere from Russia to England, from Taiwan to the United States and everything in between. Almost anywhere you look, the first women to have ever voted were women who either served in the military or owned land. Or both. But all of that was turned on its head when the connection between rights and responsibilities was axed in order to make room for women. Suddenly, men had the responsibility of defending their country in order to get the right to vote, whilst women had the responsibility of breathing till the age of 18 in order to get the right to vote. You know, we have a word for rights without responsibilities. Privileges. For close to 100 years in some jurisdictions, women have been enjoying the privilege of voting, and if you dare to say anything about that, you're a misogynist. And misogyny is bad, okay? Now, if the no side wants to be consistent, then they should also advocate some removal of privileges from women in exchange for being allowed to extract themselves from the duty of defending their country to the best of their capabilities. But you see, that's not a popular position to take, which makes the mainstream no side fundamentally hypocritical. You know, you gotta give it to Belfort Bax, whether you like him or not, I don't, at least he was consistent in these matters. But he also had the luck to be born in a time when being honest wasn't such a transgression. Now, personally, I support the freedom alternative. I think the whole bureaucracy of selective service should be abolished and I believe that not just out of principle but also as a matter of practicality. Now, the US's Internal Revenue Service already has much more extensive and up-to-date databases that then the selective service has. So if Uncle Sam wants a list of available potential soldiers, that list can be queried from there, both on the male and the female half of the population. Also, since having a car and a driver's license is pretty much a must in the US, as opposed to Europe, such a list could also reasonably be queried from the DMV's database. No need for another bloated bureaucracy. The money saved from abolishing this bureaucracy could be used to cover some of the recent increases in military spending, for instance, 
or give it back to the taxpayers through a well-deserved tax cut. Either options would be a better use of tax dollars than maintaining this thing. At the end of the day, we have to remember that the situation doesn't necessarily become better if an application of a law or principle is equal. If the law or the principle itself is faulty, then an equal application makes it equally bad for everyone and does little to improve the lot of those affected. Now, on a broader note, the topic of conscription and military service won't go away anytime soon because even though the nature of war has somehow changed, uh, war is and will always be with us. Now, sure, it would be nice if there were no more wars, just like it would be nice if we could all have a yacht and a house on the beach of Miami. But the real world doesn't work that way. Nevertheless, I contend that volunteer armies are superior to armies made up of conscripts and for as long as those are possible, and they are, this model should be preferred to the draft-oriented model. And with that being said, thank you all for watching and um, I'll see you around on Freedom Alternative.